Uh, my name is Ankur Mohan. Uh, thank you very much for attending my presentation. I'm the uh, product manager for uh, Gameware. Uh, I've been with the Scaleform team for about six years. Um, and for, for most of my time at Scaleform, I was an engineer. And uh, last year, I moved into a uh, product management role. Um, so in my presentation, I'm going to be talking about some of the best practices with using Scaleform. And uh, following these best practices will enable you to get better rendering performance and uh, better memory usage. And you will also learn some interesting tricks that are helpful while using Click. Um, before I proceed, um, I wanted to, to, do, to do a show of hands. And uh, uh, how, how many people here have heard of Scaleform? OK. So, so, so most of you know what Scaleform is. Oh, that's good. Um, how many people here are Flash artists or designers? And, and then uh, how, how, how many people are C++ programmers? OK, so, okay, so we, we have, it seems like there are more uh, programmers than artists and designers. OK, well, that's good to know. So uh, what is Scaleform? I'm just going to sp spend um, like two slides talking about what Scaleform is. Um, Scaleform is the uh, leading Flash-based uh, user interface middleware. Uh, Scaleform brings the uh, power and convenience of Flash to build uh, dynamic, interactive UI content. Uh, it combines the performance of hardware-accelerated 3D graphics technology with the productivity and workflow of Adobe Flash. And as um, Mark mentioned, uh, Scaleform is a proven runtime solution. Um, over 1,500 games have been licensed using Scale Scaleform so far. And um, as you can see, some of the uh, famous AAA uh, titles made by the leading uh, game developers in the world have used Scaleform. And now the same technology that has been uh, used in all these uh, AAA games are available for mobile games. And my colleague, uh, Jeremy, will talk more about the use of Scaleform in mobile games. So as I said, my, my presentation is geared towards helping you get the best performance out of Scaleform. Uh, it assumes some prior knowledge of Scaleform and Flash Studio. Um, so if you are not able to follow everything that I say in my presentation, do not worry. But just try to get a general idea. And uh, we'll make my presentation as well as the associated Flash files available on our developer center. So you can always come back and take a look later. But I, I want you to get a general idea uh, about the concepts that I'll be discussing in my presentation. So if you're not able to follow everything that I say, don't worry. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about um, batching. So batching refers to combining uh, geometrically disconnected elements that use the same fill style into one batch or into one draw primitive. Um, this reduces the number of draw calls. And the ability to batch elements together is one of the big strengths of the scale form renderer. So we, we will learn how to calculate batching performance, uh, how to use uh, the visualization tools available in the scale form player to see which elements are batched together. And then we'll also talk about some techniques that will help you get better batching. Overdraw. So overdraw refers to drawing the same pixel multiple times. Overdraw can happen when you have overla overlapping content, and thus the overlapping pixels is shared by more than one um, object. Um, overdraw can reduce rendering performance because the same pixel is drawn multiple times by the renderer. And so we'll learn how to use uh, vectors to reduce overdraw. The next thing is texture atlasing. Texture atlasing means combining different textures into uh, one large texture. Uh, these textures can come from um, embedded images and glyphs in the flash file, or they can be externally loaded images. Texture atlasing, again, helps you to get, or get better uh, batching performance. And then lastly, we'll talk about how to use click more effectively. Um, how many people here use click? Click stands for, OK. So it seems like about half the 
people here have some familiarity with Click. So one thing we hear a lot from our customers is that they, when they use Click, the memory usage goes up a lot. So I'm going to be talking about some techniques that will um, help you reduce memory consumption while using Click. Um, so all the optimizations that I'll talk about are made possible um, by using the features offered by Flash uh, Studio and Scaleform. So this further illustrates the power of uh, using the artist driven workflow made possible by using scale form. So moving on. <clears throat> so batching, what, what is batching? Batching reverts to combining shapes with compatible properties into a single draw primitive. So in general, you want to keep the number of draw primitives in your scene as low as possible because uh, display rendering performance um, declines linearly as more draw primitives are introduced into the scene because each draw primitives is rendered independently, incurring a performance cost. So fewer draw primitive means better performance. So before, before we go into how to reduce the number of draw primitives, we'll talk first about how, how do you know how many draw, draw primitives you have. And by the way, I, I'm using the term um, batch here. The, Batch is the same as a draw primitive. So one batch is drawn in a draw primitive. So I'm, I'm in my presentation, I'm going to be using the term batch and draw primitive interchangeably. So in order to see the number of uh, batches, you can use uh, control F. And let me run a simple uh, file here. So this is, this is the scale form player. It's running a simple Swift file. And I have uh, two shapes here that use a gradient fill. So if I, if I want to see the number of uh, draw primitives, I can use Control F. And you can see that I have uh, one, w one draw primitive here. P stands for the number of draw primitives. M stands for the number of meshes. So this is telling me that I have two meshes. And they're being bashed together into one draw primitive then I can also use F2, which uh, sh shows me, um, it gives me a little bit more information about what's going on. So uh, you can see the number of triangles. Um, you, you, you can see the number of um, um, meshes here, and so on. So there, there are two ways that you can see uh, the number of meshes and the number of um, draw primitives, here and here, right? Okay. And then you can also use control J. Um, and that shows up the uh, visualization, uh, the batch visual visualization mode. Let me just run the same example again. So if I do control J here, then the, the uh, shapes that are drawn in the same color are, are part of one batch. So you can also use that to see how many, uh, to see which uh, meshes are being bashed together. So uh, let's talk about a measure that helps you uh, estimate the uh, batching performance. So if you look at the uh, number of batches divided by the number of meshes, this gives you, this, 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 is a, this is an indicator of the batching performance. And you want this number to be as low as possible. Right? So you want uh, as many of your meshes to be put in one batch. So the, uh, the lowest possible, the highest number for, the highest uh, measure for this is one. And so if this, if this ratio is one, that means that you have as many batches as the number of meshes, which means you're not getting any batching at all. So in general, you want this number to be as low as possible. So how do you get more batching? Generally speaking, non-overlapping shapes that use the same fill style are batched together. So there are, in Flash, there are uh, four fill styles, solid fill, gradient, linear gradient, radial gradient, and bitmap fills. So non-overlapping shapes that use the same fill style are typically bashed together. If you're using gradients, you have to make sure that the gradients are of the same type and the same color. So if you, if you, if you have two um, non-overlapping shapes that use, one of them uses um, a linear gradient, 
while the other uses a bitmap gradient, I mean, uh, um, uh, a radial gradient, they will not be bashed together. And even if you have the same gradient type, but they're using different colors, they will still not be bashed together. So you have to make sure that your gradients have to be the same type and the same color. And then if you have uh, um, movie, ki movie clip uh, blend modes and color effects, then that can also affect uh, batching. So you can have uh, darken, multiply, add, subtract, and so on for blend modes. And you can have different color effects like uh, brightness, tint, alpha. So th these, th these different color effects and blend modes can also affect batching. So the next, next topic we'll talk about is overdraw. So overdraw refers to how many times a pixel is drawn on average. So you want uh, overdraw to be as low as possible because every time a pixel is drawn, that's wasted work by the renderer. So overdraw can, can be a, a, a limiting factor on lower end hardware. Um, like for example, um, the iPhone 4 um, uh, or any, any older generation hardware uh, that is a, a, a fill rate limited um, can have problems with overdraw. Um, so let, let's consider a simple example. If you have um, an hardware with, uh, with a fill rate of 166 million pixels per second, that means that your hardware is only capable of drawing 166 million pixels per second. And now that sounds like a lot, but when you, when you look at, if you have a target resolution of uh, 1280 by 800, which, uh, which leads to about a um, 1 million pixels on the screen, and then a refresh rate of 60 hertz, which means that your screen is being refreshed 60 times a second, then the, then the maximum overdraw, which is given by this formula, is 2.75. So what this means is that you can only write a pixel about three times before the fill rate becomes a limiting factor. So no matter what else you do in your content, your performance will be limited by this fill rate. So out of this, the initial clear takes up one overdraw. So when you, when you start rendering a frame, you have to clear out the frame buffer, right? You have to uh, fill it up with a, with a background color, and that, that takes up one overdraw. So you're essentially only left with about two for, for your content. So you can see that you have to be very careful about how much overdraw you are getting in your scene because that can, that can drastically limit your uh, performance. So that's why it is important to keep overdraw in mind while designing your content. And Scaleform provides you uh, a number of tools that allows you to see how much overdraw you have in your scene. And then we'll also discuss a technique that uses uh, vectors to reduce overdraw. So first of all, let's talk about um, how do you see overdraw. So this is, this is one of our uh, 3D generator samples. And if you, if you look at uh, this, this, uh, th th these three uh, concentric circles here, so you can see there is an outside circle, and then there is an uh, uh, inside circle. Uh, these are all uh, bitmaps that are arranged in different flash layers. So they are drawn on top of each other. And this is the uh, visualization mode. So here, uh, the lighter green color means that those, these pixels are drawn, they're being overdrawn. So, so in, in general, uh, you, you want things like these, and not like these, because the, the, the lighter the green color is, that means you're getting more overdraw. By the way, let me just quickly ask, are you guys familiar with this at all? Like, do, you, do you guys use this uh, visu visualization mode when you are uh, using Scaleform? L let, let me have a show of hands. Uh, how many people know about uh, this tool? Okay, so, so it seems like not, not, not many of you know how, how to use these uh, visualization features. So like I said, if you, if you run your content in the Scaleform player and you push F2, uh, that's going to show you uh, a rendering performance. If you push F1, that's going to give you um, a, a legend that shows you different uh, uh, keyboard commands. So let's go here. So for example, if I push F1 here, it's going to give me a legend that 
that tells me which, which keyboard command does what. So you can see that control J uh, toggles the uh, batch, batch profile. Control E, uh, here's control E, does the overdraw, right? So if I do control E, this, this, this shows me uh, what's going on with the overdraw. So I would encourage you to spend some time and just play with these different modes and see what each one of these does. So in the, in the rest of my example, we'll be uh, looking at this, this file. So I have two con concentric circles here with like some animation going on. So I have the outside circle that is moving up and down, and then I have the inside circle that is rotating. So we'll be uh, looking at this example while learning how to reduce overdraw. So uh, let's, let's for a moment uh, go back to Flash Studio and let's look at how this sample is implemented. So we have three layers here. We have circle two, circle one, and the background, right? So, so we have this background, then we have this outside circle, and then we have this inside circle. So three, three Flash layers, right? Each of these circles is two images. So so there are three layers, the background layer, and then these two other layers that contain the bitmaps, right? But, but you can see that most of these bitmaps are actually empty, right? The, the content in these bitmaps is only here and here. The rest of it is just empty space. And, uh, and you can further see that uh, the, the alpha for these uh, bitmaps is zero. So, you know, all of these pixels here are actually transparent. So you don't see them in the bitmap, but they're still drawn by the hardware. So that's what contributes to the overdraw. So you, you have uh, three bitmaps here. Most of them have uh, transparent pixels, but they will still be drawn by scale form. So if I, if I run this again, So you can see that these, these bitmaps are still being drawn. So what do we, how, how do we uh, take care of the situation? How do we reduce overdraw? So one way to do that is to convert these bitmaps into vector shapes and then use a bitmap fill. So this is one area where Scaleform shines with this flash-based flash -based pipeline because Flash Studio provides you a tool that allows you to convert these bitmaps into shapes. So you, you take these bitmaps and you convert it into a shape and then you use a bitmap fill. And then what you do is to carve out the interior using uh, vector editing tools, right? So now, now you have converted this bitmap into a vector shape and then you have carved out the interior. So now you don't have all this interior region. So if I uh, go to the next, let me, let me run the previous version. So here, this is still using bitmap, uh, this is still using uh, just the plain bitmaps. And we can see that it, there's a lot of overdraw going on here, right? While in the next example, So here I've converted these bitmaps into uh, shapes using bitmap fills, and then I've carved out the interior using vector editing tools. So now you can see that the overdraw is a lot less because all these interior pixels are not being drawn anymore. So this has significantly reduced overdraw. And it, I mean, if you're not able to follow completely what I'm saying, do not worry. Like I said, we'll post these samples on our de developer center and you can go back and you can open these files in Flash Studio and you can see how these things are being done. I just want you, to guys, want you guys to get a general idea that this is the technique that you can use to reduce overdraw. And this is going to have a dramatic impact on your uh, rendering performance, especially on hardware that is fill rate limited. So the basic idea is you take your bitmaps, you convert them into shapes that use bitmap fills, 
and then you use vector editing tools to carve out the interior region that would have been overlapped by other layers. So you're only drawing content that is not going to be overlapped. Oops. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay, so the, the other point is that, um, you, actually, let me just go back to the previous example for just a second. Then let me r run this again. So the other thing to notice is that when we convert uh, bitmaps into vectors, we introduce triangles. So you can see if I, if I switch to the uh, triangle mode, you can see that now we have generated all these extra triangles, right? So this technique that involves converting your bitmaps into uh, shapes and then carving out the interior comes at a cost because it in, you, you generate more triangles now. However, hardware is typically a lot more efficient at rendering triangles. So this is not, not, not a huge deal. And you can also, uh, you using, uh, if you use a fine shape, you get a lot more triangles. If you use a coarse shape, then you get fewer triangles. So you can achieve a trade-off between how many triangles you generate by using different, uh, different carves. So you can, you can keep the number of triangles lower by using a coarse carve, or you can have larger number of triangles by using a smoother carve. So to sum up, too much overdraw can reduce rendering performance. You can use control E in the scale form player to see overdraw. Lighter green means more overdraw. Remember that transparent pixels in your bitmaps are drawn and contribute to overdraw. So if you have a bitmap with a lot of transparent pixels, those transparent pixels will still be drawn by the hardware and will, will have a cost. One way to reduce overdraw is to use shapes that use bitmap fills. And these shapes can then be carved out so that the overlapping areas are not drawn. Just want you guys to take all this information in for a second. So like I said before, if you're not following everything that I'm saying, do not worry. We'll make this information available on our developer center. You can always come back and take a look later. But just remember that uh, converting your bitmaps into shapes and then carving out the interior is a very uh, effective way of reducing overdraw. Okay, in the next section, we'll be talking about effective use of click. So CLIC stands for Common Lightweight Interface Kit. CLIC is our uh, Flash component library. Contains uh, canned implementations for commonly used UI elements such as uh, buttons, scroll bars, text areas, etc. cetera. Um, you know, CLIC is a great way to, to do prototyping to get, to get quickly um, something running. Um, it reduces the number of lines of code that you have to write, reduces bugs. Uh, makes your design faster and easier. In this presentation, we'll focus on uh, how to reduce the uh, memory used by click components by efficiently sharing resources, and then some common pitfalls encountered while using click. So uh, this is a really simple example. Uh, let me just uh, play this first so you see what's going on here. So I have a simple flash file with five click buttons. Okay. So here, he, here I have a, just one click button, and then here I have another file that contains five buttons. Okay. If I look at the size of this file, it's uh, 6.17 megabytes. Here I have another file that contains five instances of the same button. The size of this file is 6.186 megabytes. So it's just a little bit larger than this file. Right, and this is expected. There is a, only a small increase in the size because Scaleform shares resources such as fonts, graphics, etc. So you might ask, wh why the size is even six megabytes? This is because I am embedding uh, Corian glyphs. So if, if we look at the uh, structure of a click button in Flash Studio, we see that we have uh, four layers here. So we have the actions layer where your action script code goes. 
and you have the overlay layer that controls the appearance of the uh, click button when you move the mouse over or when you click on the button, etc. And then you have the text field that contains the text that shows up in your click button. And then we have the button layer that contains the background graphic for the click button. So we have, we have four layers. And in the text field, we are embedding all these Korean fonts. This is uh, AMP. AMP stands for uh, Analyzer for Memory and Performance. Um, the AMP is our profiling tool. It allows you to see uh, frame level statistics for what's going on, uh, your advance and display times, um, uh, memory rendering performance. So um, I, I would encourage you all to uh, use AMP, uh, play with it, uh, get comfortable with using it. And um, w in order to see a detailed memory profile, you can uh, a toggle this eye button that allows you to see in detail how much memory is being consumed by different parts of your flash file. So this is the uh, memory um, profile report. And you can see that uh, in this uh, uh, flash file, um, the, your, your fonts are part of your movie def. And so this is, this is what is taking up most of the memory, right? So now, now let's take a step back and think about how, how, when, you're, when you're uh, making uh, your Flash content, if you have a large amount of Flash content, uh, you, you don't want to have one big Flash file that contains all your content, right? Because that, that leads to, uh, that's hard to manage, right? So let me just run this. So this is my container Swift file. I have two buttons, load and unload. When I click on load, it loads, it, loads in the, it, it uh, loads the Swift file that contains this button. And then same thing with, with the other buttons, right? So now these, these buttons are not part of this file, but they're actually, uh, they live in different Swift files and they're loaded in dynamically using this code, right? So those of you who are ActionScript developers should be familiar with, with this stuff. You create a loader, um, you install a, a, a listener for the uh, complete event. So when your file finishes uh, loading, um, you attach it to the stage. So this is like a common technique that uh, ActionScript developers should be familiar with, right? But now if you look at the size of this file in AMP, we see that it's 15.3 megabytes. So the same content before was just about six megabytes. Now when we dynamically load these Swift files, the size go increases to 15.3 megabytes. That's an increase of more than 100%, right? So this is, this is very typical of what our customers experience. They, they have uh, multiple Swift files, and each Swift file has many instances of click components. And then they load these Swift files in dynamically into a container Swift. And then they find out that the size of the container Swift blows up. And then they are wondering what's going on, right? So the problem is that you're not sharing resources. The problem is that each Swift file is embedding its own font data, which is causing the size of the parent Swift to blow up. Um, so the solution to this problem is to create a resource lib. So you create a Swift file that exports shared resources, and then this Swift exports the resources that will be shared by other Flash files, right? So you, you create a Swift file that, sh that exports all the resources that you expect to be shared by other Flash content, right? So you mark your uh, shared uh, resource as export for action script. And then um, you import the shared resource in other flash files that need it, right? So here I'm importing my click button. So here I'm ex exporting it, and in all the files that use it, I import it. So this kind of uh, shows you um, uh, pictorially what's going on. Uh, you create a resource library it exports the resources that you, that you expect to be used in, uh, in other Swift files. 
and then you and then uh, all of the other screens in your game will import those resources. So when we when we set up our resource sharing correctly, then uh, when you look at your content in uh, AMP, you will see that the size comes down to what you had before when you had all those buttons in the same Swift file. So now the movie data for each component Swift only takes up a small amount of space because all of the fonts are now coming from the shared resource. So um, to, to sum up, whenever you have uh, multiple flash files that are using the same resource, you should set up a resource uh, sharing uh, library that exports that resource and then import that in all the Swift files that use it. And then uh, this is uh, um, a, a trick that, you know, once you set this up, you, will, you might get a, a mysterious uh, compiler error. And uh, the, the idea is that uh, you have to actually create a definition for this class. If you don't understand this point too well, don't worry about it. But just remember that, you know, when you actually use this technique and you are setting up your uh, shared uh, library, if you get a mysterious compiler error, you know, come back to my presentation and see how you solve it. But you basically create an action script. You create, uh, you have to create the definition of this class into a separate action script file. Okay, so some, some more tricks. When you are unloading a Swift file, you have to make sure to call this unload and stop on the loader. Otherwise, your movie clip will not be released from memory. Excuse me. So uh, you know, so this is the this is the code that gets called when you uh, click on the button that unloads the movie clips. And uh, if you do not call this uh, uh, unload and stop, the Swift files will I mean the movie clips will be removed from stage, but they will actually not be released from memory. So they will still uh, consume memory. In order to really get rid of the the movie clip, you have to call unload and stop. Then there is another trick. Um, in terms of class definitions, so here I have uh, my. This is using a MMO kit example. So this this is the uh, the Swift that is the manager Swift or the container Swift that loads in these uh, child Swifts. Each of these child Swifts uses an instance of this class foo. So this is like some gen general class foo that is shared by all these files. But the runtime uses the class definition that was uh, loaded in by the first file that was loaded. So when you try to unload this file, the fi this file will actually not get unloaded because it, it imported a class definition that, was th that is being used by other Swift files. So the way to solve this problem is to use this uh, piece of code um, that uh, promotes this class definition into the manager Swift. And since the manager Swift lives uh, throughout the lifetime of your game, the class dependencies will not be an issue. So again, if you're not understanding this completely, do not worry, but just remember that if you, if you have multiple uh, child Swifts, each of them use a common class, and then you are unloading the one of the Swifts, and it is not getting fully unloaded. That could be because it's using a common class that was imported by this Swift. And the way to solve this problem is to promote this Swift into the manager Swift using this piece of code. Okay, a couple of more uh, uh, tricks using click. So case, the first trick is when you have a rollover area that is bigger than the click button. Let me just uh, play an example first. So 
don't don't focus on this first. Just look at the uh, top three click buttons. So this is a normal normal button, right? You roll over on it and it changes color. This is a button that is broken. So when I roll over on it, it starts behaving erratically. And then this button fixes it. So what is what is different here is that you have a rollover area that is larger than the than the click button itself. So here, when I roll over, the rollover is the same. Roll, rollover area is the same as a click button, where here it's larger. So let's look at what's going on. Um, so here, mm, excuse me. So uh, th this is my rollover state, and. This rollover state con contains this uh, rectangle that is bigger than the click button. So click has this uh, property called auto resize. And what happens is that when a child object of a click button changes size, the entire button is get, gets resized, which may, not all, which may not be the desired behavior. So in order to solve this problem, you need to disable auto sizing. So you create a new class that derives from the click button class and then turn off auto sizing in the constructor. So a click button normally uses um, a default button class, but instead what you do is you create um, a, a derived button class like this. And this derived button extends the button class and in the constructor of this class, you set auto sizing to true, prevent auto sizing to true. So this prevents the click button from auto sizing itself, and it takes care of that problem that we discussed before. So again, just to sum it up, if you have, if you, if you have a click button that has um, you know, a rollover or a, 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 a some, some state, um, some child state that has a larger area and you are seeing some erratic behavior, then just remember that this is the technique that you use to solve the problem. The second case is when you are animating a click button where the animation requires a change of scale. So this is my uh, click uh, timeline animation, right? Um, and so here on the first frame, I have a click button. And then on, the, on the, uh, the, this frame, I have the same button, but it's larger in size and it's moved down. So again, when you have something like this that involves a change of scale, this will not work properly unless you embed the click button into a bag movie clip. So if you are trying to animate a click button just by itself, it's not going to work properly. What you have to instead do is to uh, put it inside of another movie clip and and then uh, it's going to work correctly. So again, just, just remember, if you have problems with animating click buttons, the problem could be because the animation requires a change of scale, and click has this uh, prevent uh, auto sizing property set to false. So you have to set that property to true, or you have to embed that click button into another movie clip. So again, if you're not fully understanding what I'm saying, not a problem. But if you are having problems with click button animations, come back to my presentation, take a look at these slides, and it'll all make sense. To sum up, while using click buttons in multiple Swift files, make sure to share resources. If you do not share resources, each, each uh, click component will bring in their own resource. And by the way, I'm, I'm using a, the a click button as just an example that this technique about sharing resources applies to Flash in general. So this is not limited to a click button. I'm using a button just as an example. So you create a shared library that exports resources, and then you import these resources into any Swift files that need them. And if you're not sure what's going on, use AMP, use the detailed memory report. It will actually show you what part of your uh, content is uh, consuming a lot of memory. Yeah?
So, so use AMP in case you are wondering why your flash content is consuming a lot of memory. Use the uh, detailed memory report, and that will help you out. And then uh, be aware of the pitfalls discussed regarding click rollover states and animating click buttons that involve scale changes. OK, the last thing I'm going to talk about is texture atlasing. So um, how many people here have heard of texture atlasing or, or use it? OK, so very few. So again, uh, texture atlasing is a very important technique that will allow you to get better performance, uh, better rendering performance. So what it basically means is to combine small textures into a large textures. So these textures could come from the Swift file. So they could be uh, internal images or bitmaps that are uh, part of the Swift file itself, or they could be externally loaded images. So uh, if you have shapes that use diff different bitmap fills, they will not be batched, because each bitmap will be a different texture. However, if you arrange these textures into a texture atlas, this allows batching to take place, improving running performance. So uh, we have this uh, tool called GFX export that um, strips out the uh, images, um, glyphs, et cetera, that are part of your flash file, and it stores them into a compressed hardware, um, uh, uh, hardware specific formats um, and allows you to create texture addresses uh, automatically. So um, when, you, when you are ready to deploy your flash content, you should make sure to run it through export uh, and uh, you know, put your um, images, glyphs, et cetera, into a texture atlas. So this, uh, this is taken from our, our MMO kit. So this is how a texture atlas looks like. You have many small images in your flash content. Exporter strips them out, stores them into compressed hardware uh, formats, and then puts them into one giant texture. So this is, this is what a texture atlas is. It's one big texture that packs in your uh, smaller textures. Um, so the last point that I will make is that uh, there are two types of uh, textures. You can have embedded flash textures, or you can also have um, external images that are loaded in from, you know, from, from external files. So our, our uh, MMO kit shows you an example of how to create texture atlases from externally loaded images. Um, and uh, this is implemented in this uh, game UI runtime atlas dot um, cpp. So you know, uh, go and take a look at how you implement texture atlasing with uh, externally loaded images, and that again, uh, using texture atlasing will have a dramatic impact on rendering performance. So make sure that you run your Flash content through GFX Exporter, create uh, GFX files, create texture atlases. If you're loading uh, external, external images, uh, such as uh, with icons, um, go uh, see how um, these externally loaded images can be put onto a big texture um, through your ex application externally. And this can also give you a big performance boost. So just to sum up, we talked about how to reduce overdraw by using vectors. We learned what batching is, how to see uh, uh, batching using scale from visual visualization modes, uh, what type of content is batched together, and then we learned about uh, using um, uh, creating uh, resource libraries to share resources effectively, and then we learned about texture atlasing. So just remember these concepts. Like I said, we'll make uh, uh, my presentation as well as all of the flash files uh, on our developer center. So come back, take a look. Uh, Using these techniques will help you get better performance from Scaleform, help you get better rendering performance, help you reduce memory, um, generally make you ha happier customers. So thank you. <laughs>